<laughs> Good move. Okay. Okay, cool. So first thing you'll need today is this source sheet. Um, if you don't have it, that's fine. I'm going to read out different parts from it. It was sent out um, to you. It's fine if you don't have it because we're gonna be going between this and really the PowerPoint presentation um, or the Prezi presentation. So, um, so without further ado, let's get going. Okay, I'm really excited for this class today. I'm kind of excited about this whole unit, um, this whole semester, because um, there's just so much material to go through, and it's like all new. I think for OBL, new for a lot of people here, so that's exciting. Um, and it's, and I think that my hope is that through this exposure to the richness of um, these different uh, groups, these different Jewish groups and ethnicities, um, hopefully you'll like be open to. Um, engaging them in the future, maybe taking positive things from um, the different groups that we're going to present. So we last week we talked, um, if, you, if you remember, we talked about Sephardim and Mizrahim, and we talked about like the difference between Mizrahi and Sephardi, and um, how in Israel, a large percentage of the Israeli society is Mizrahi, and we said that Sephardim are from Spain, went through that whole um, history. And today we're going to go less into the geographical Piece and more into the neshama, the spirituality, and the culture. Next week, we're going to go into customs and halacha, which I'm also excited about. There's some really interesting halachot um, in Sephardic sock. Um, and the week after, we're going to talk about Rabbi Vadi Yosef and other, any other rabbis that I want to talk about from that uh, from the Sephardic community. So today's topic is, let's go back here, spirituality and cultures. This is the structure again. Um, and again, I'm basing these lec this lecture on, the source that I gave is basically based on these two books. This is Rabbi um, Mark Angel, did, he's actually got an award, National Jewish Book Award, uh, award finalist. It's a good book. And uh, here's another one, which is actually a lovely read too. Um, I'll link to them somehow. I'm going to make a bibliography so you can have that. Um, so he, in his, the final, I think it's the final chapter of this book, Spartac Spirituality, he goes through a list of different aspects that stand out in Spartac spirituality. And these are the ones that he lists. And there's, there's, there's a few more throughout his works. Um, and I kind of like put, put one, I think natural living, I put uh, from what I saw in his other book or whatever, just from my experience too. So what I'll talk about is these different aspects of Spartac spirituality. Um, my experience with them, my personal experience with them, um, some of my feelings about them, uh, every positive aspect of spirit, Spartac spirituality also uh, has another side to it, has the other side, um, which is sometimes is tempered by Ashkenazic um, worldview and Ashkenazic spirituality. So uh, we'll go through that and also on the sources of these different aspects of Spartac spirituality. So the first one's natural living, optimism and joy, interiority, mysticism, aesthetics, kavod, proportion, balance, religious humanism, and piety. So we're gonna just get started. I'm going to um, kind of toggle in between my, um, my uh, speaker view and the presentation. So if you want, I'm going to read a little bit from page page two of the source sheet. Um, okay, this is, so if you, you feel free to read page one and two, but this is uh, taken from his book, uh, The Rhythms of Jewish Living. I'm reading the paragraph on page two on the right side, where he says, the Jewish ideal of a religious person has gone to go, undergone a change over the centuries. Until relatively modern times, the ideal religious personality was one who spent much time outdoors who contemplated the wonders of the universe and the wisdom of its maker. The ideal Jew lived in harmony with nature and participated in its rhythms. This book is called The Rhythms of Jewish Living. So uh, it's pretty neat how he discusses, like he connects it with Sephardic spirituality, how it's kind of more, according to his opinion, more in line with the rhythms of nature and like the natural life, which I think is interesting. 
The ideal Jew lived in harmony with nature and participated in its rhythms. The notion that ideal piety can be found in a pale, scholarly, undernourished saint who spends his days and nights studying Torah in a study hall is not true to the original Jewish vision, religious vision. The biblical heroes and prophets, the Talmudic sages, the medieval pietists and, and mystics all were involved in outdoor religion. So it's just an interesting statement, a statement that there's no between indoor Judaism and outdoor Judaism, and that we've really moved far away from outdoor Judaism. Um, I'll give you an example. I think he brings in this book, but it's actually happened to me. I, my, when I first became observant, I, I, would come, I, would, I lived in Israel, but I would come back to Philadelphia every summer. And my sisters, every time I came back the first three years or so, they were amazed each time anew by the crazy, like crazy laws and strict, strict, and strict, strict customs that I took upon myself. So like, they would always ask me questions sometimes like for real, sometimes sarcastically. So when it was Shabbos, um, I was like laying around, it's like one of the long summer Shabbos that I come for Shabbos. And, and my sister's like, no, or we want to go out. We want to do something like, what are you, why are you just laying around? When's, when Shabbos going to be here? I was like, listen, um, I have to wait till the specific time, 940, when the three stars come out. Like, why don't you just step outside and see if the stars came out? All right. So that's the interesting doing outdoor Judaism and indoor Judaism. We go by calendars. Our holidays are all indoors. And so um, like Shavuot in biblical times was an agricultural holiday. Today, it's a, all about learning Torah all night. So there's a lot of examples of this and there's a lot to say on this. Once I wrote a sermon, I gave a sermon on this on Shavuot about indoor and outdoor Judaism. I can link to that if you want. But it basically says that Sephardic Judaism, uh, according to his opinion, and all these expo- all these. Um, a lot of these portrayals are going to be very generous to Sephardim. So I'm going to, I'll, I'll be, some of them are a little apologetic and I'll, I'll note that, but um, he kind of says that Sephardim are more connected to like a, more of a natural, less um, analytical and less, um, uh, less, uh, um, he, less self analytical and more holistic, more uh, approach to life. So that means that, Kind of like they're more integrated in experiencing what's going on, less about thinking about what's going on. So that's the source on page three, which I think is a, a really interesting uh, distinction or a dichotomy that he presents here, which is true not just for Sephardim and Ashkenazim, but I think it, it, he said it's true for Eastern and Western religions. So if you know if you if you got this from this class, I think it's a valuable uh, valuable piece of knowledge. This is page three. It says, Alan Watts pointed out that in Western thought, the individual split. I'm not, I'm, and I'm not personally critiquing this. I love this piece, part of Western thought. And that's why I connect with it a lot. But I'm just, I'm observing. I'm not like uh, prescribing what's right or wrong. One is both herself and the observer of herself. We analyze ourselves and tend to see ourselves as though we are somehow outside of ourselves. Carried to an extreme, this can be confusing and frustrating. It is though we live our lives while seeing ourselves in a mirror. So we're always asked kind of in in our culture to analyze ourselves, to reflect, to process on what happened. Oftentimes we spend a lot of time thinking about what happened, what's going to happen, uh, how we felt about this or that and the other, and less time experiencing what's actually happening. He says here, um, uh, we are apt to become overly self-conscious, self-critical, and self-centered. Eastern culture, on the other hand, tends to be more holistic and less self-analytical. People are taught to live naturally. This goes back to the, 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 um, the rhythms of living I mentioned and easily without objectifying themselves overly much. Watts has written, the most spiritual people are the most human. They are natural and easy in manner. They give themselves no airs. They interest themselves in ordinary everyday matters. They're not forever talking and thinking about religion, not thinking about religion, they're living religion. For them, there is no difference between spirituality and usual life. And to their awakened insight, the lives of the most humdrum and earthbound people are as much in harmony with the infinite as their own. Okay, so this can explain a lot of aspects of Sparta culture. And I'm not saying one's better than the other. You need both. But Sparta culture, um, even the even like the lay person that you'll find in like, it's like a, like a very basic synagogue in, in Israel, they're all filled with such great, uh, I, from my experience, such great faith in Hashem simple faith in Hashem, like you'll stand, uh, I, I enter, when I first came to Israel, I was amazed by it. Um, I would come into a Sephardic synagogue and uh, when they read certain parts of prayer, it said, everybody literally was, they would open their hands and thank Hashem in the whole synagogue. And then they go something like this, kissing their hands or something like, like meaning like even the simple person is involved in this engagement with spirituality in a natural way, as opposed to 
perhaps other schools, other directions, more in an Ashkenazi culture or Western culture, which I appreciate too, it's more analyzing the text, analyzing halacha, analyzing how we should be kind of reflecting on it. Whereas there, sometimes it's more engaged and direct. This is what he says, um, Heim, uh, Mark Angel, in the final paragraph on page three. The Sephardi tend to have the Eastern rather than the Western attitude in life. The halacha was observed naturally and easily as a vital part of life. Um, the Jews of the Maghreb were quite observant of halakha, and the Judaism of the most conservative of the Ma Maghreb Jews were marked by flexibility, hospitality, and tolerance. So this also explains like um, how, oh, we'll see in, in a moment, I'll share with you an experience now that I had when I first came to Israel, and this will be the first part of our, um, of our slide, of our slideshow here. Let me just actually share my screen with you for a moment. Okay, so here's the natural living slideshow that I want to show you. Here's a picture. Uh, let me just see. Can you see that? Show your thumbs up if you can see that. Uh, and can you see that? I can see your, your camera here. Can you see this? Okay, cool. Okay, I see a few people with thumbs up. Good. Okay. Um, all right, so let me do end of presentation mode here. Okay, so here's a picture. There's a lot to see in this picture, okay? Now, why am I showing you this picture? So this is my Saba, the, the third one from the right. That's my grandfather from my father's side. Again, my mother's side looks completely different and the food looks completely different. Everything looks different. But um, this is like a, this is what it looks like, what it looked like when I would sit down at a meal um, with my Sephardic family. <laughs> um, so there's like just so many different colors uh, so many types of food. Everybody's like really close and connected. And I want to show you, take a look at my Saba my, on the third from the right. Look at the, the colors he's wearing. He didn't wear black and white. And the Sephardic rabbis, when they came from the Sephardic countries, they didn't wear black and white. If you look at the at the end of the table, that's Rav Ben Siyon Abashaul. He's one of the biggest Sephardic, he was one of the biggest Sephardic post scheme. He's actually a family member of ours. Um, he's my Safta's her older brother, uh, her younger brother. So uh, we have connections in our family to like, uh, we have rabbinic connections. Uh, my name's actually Eliyahu in Hebrew um, based on the name of his father. So there's a story behind that, but that's for another time. Anyway, look at my Saba, he's wearing different colors. When Rav Ben Siyon Shaul at the head of the table, he came to America. I wouldn't say when he came to America. When he, when he was working as a younger rabbi, he, he wore different colors, but kind of the um, Sephardim took on a lot of the, the garb and cut at least the physical dress, the, the outer aspects of the Ashkenazi culture and their dress, the black and white, they took that upon themselves. But earlier they wore different colors. And my Saba was very big into wearing different colors. Like he had matching socks with his, with his, with his suits. And uh, that points to this idea, I believe of this like natural, natural culture where it's like um, a lot of different aspects of, of like natural life are highlighted. Here are a few that I thought of colors, like I mentioned, look all, look at all the food, all the colors of the food. I know everybody has food with colors, but there's just a, a lot of colors, a lot of smells, aromas, fragrances. So in shul, um, they'll you'll be presented with all kinds of things that you can smell between um, tobacco, like, um, uh, what is it, like um, um, smelling tobacco, um, like powder, tobacco, that type of thing, or um, blessings over um, different types of the myrtle branch, or um, or the uh, I believe it's the myrtle branch, or one of them, the hadas that smells good, or other types of rosemary, different types of branches that smell good. You'll be presented with them and sure to bless over them. Um, very, it's very into, touch is very a big thing in the Sephardic culture, um, in the sense that like everybody's kind of like plopped in and touching each other all the time, which actually um, I liked but didn't like. I like the the warmth of that, but coming from America where everybody like respects each other's space, um, that kind of sometimes made me a little uncomfortable actually. Um, and this idea of natural spirituality, which I'll share with you in a moment, simple faith, and this idea of no denominations is actually really interesting. Um, and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I'll just say something short on this, is that um, there's, no, there's no reform conservative um, Reconstructionist or reconstructing Judaism, like they're called now, or renewal. 
that again, and I think it's wonderful. I, I appreciate that, but that is a reflection on how you're living your Judaism. Sephardim just li- like kind of just live it. So they don't define themselves in a certain way. A lot of them just say, I'm not as religious as I should be. But if they're going to define themselves, they'll define themselves as Mizrahi, which means I basically do a lot of stuff I learned at my home and I should be doing more, but I don't, I, I'm not there yet. I'm not there right now. My, my father, he left, um, he grew up Orthodox. When he left his home, he retained a lot of his customs. Though. So we did Kiddush, we did, um, or Kiddush. No, we did, uh, we did Hamotzi. We didn't do Berkhan Amazon, but, um, but like we did Southern Aspects that he just took naturally from his home. And that's kind of like how a lot of Sephardim live. Their spirituality just naturally live. It's not reflected upon or analyzed or dissected or categorized as a certain, um, as a certain denomination. Now, we have like, we actually have so much to see in this slideshow, but I'm going to try to go through different parts of it. We're only, I think, in the first, only in the first one. Oh, you think? Okay. Um, all right. So I want to show you something. So we talked about um, simple faith. Oh, I want to mention one more thing here. So Sephardic culture, another, another reason why it's like kind of natural living and less reflective is the Enlightenment didn't really pass uh, through the way, uh, through the Spartac, um, areas as it did with Ashkenazic. And so, um, this kind of like distancing oneself from mythology or mysticism and critiquing it. And that kind of didn't happen as in such a strong way in the Spartac, um, areas. So therefore, um, they never kind of dis- distanced themselves from their beliefs in Shem or like in intimacy with the Shem and mysticism. Therefore, that also leads to a certain simple faith. All right, so here, I'm just going to show you, there's like so much to see here, it's amazing, but um, I just want to show you what a Sephardic prayer book looks like, and why am I showing this to you? Um, when I first came to Israel, I was a young boy, I was 18, I didn't, I, I think I had like long hair at the time, and once upon a time, I had like, I think, well, I know I did, in high school, I had like a nose ring, I was like, kind of like this like lost lost boy, and I came to Israel, and uh, my Saba and Safta took me in, and my Saba sat me down, and he says, I'm going to teach you a little bit about Judaism, okay, so usually someone, you sit someone down, you teach them about Judaism, you might start learning with them the Alafed or a Chumash, you know what he taught me, I want to show you, this is what he taught me, this is one of our first meetings, uh, where is it, here you go, this is what he taught me, so he, he opened up a prayer book, <laughs> and he said, this is how we pray, and if you pay attention, at uh, this is a prayer, Sephardic prayer book. Look at number three. I'll even zoom in a little bit. It says, number three says, Mikan ad baruch shamar hu olam ha So the Sephardic prayer is, uh, you, have corp- you have the sacrifices that are mentioned in the very beginning of Sephardic prayer. And then you have Sukkot Zimra. Then you have the blessings of the Shema and then the Amidah. According to Sephardic, Sephardim in general and in, in Kabbalah, it's not by chance that there's four stages. Each stage corresponds to different spiritual worlds. Okay. So this is this is actually in a, like a standard Sephardic prayer book. It tells you when you start the prayer that right now you're in the, the world of Asiya. Okay. And then when you go to for instance the Amida, it tells you you're in the fourth world. This is like what it's like it's the common thing you're supposed to you're supposed to you're supposed to know and think about while you're davening that you're ascending spiritual worlds and this is what he taught me in the very beginning when i sat down and what i want to show by by relaying this to you is that um it's like a naturalness in that community when it comes to spirituality where yeah sure we're just going through worlds i'm just gonna teach you this uh, on our first or second meeting together about judaism and this is like something basic you need to know that's that's, that's why i wanted to show that to you um so I want to show you just a few more things, and then we'll go um, we'll go to the next slide. Let's see here. Uh, so take a look. Sephardic prayer, but while I'm talking about prayer, I'm just showing you a few other pieces here. So if you pay attention here, uh, in the Sephardic and the Amida, you have different letters. You have the Yud Aleph, that's number two. You have here even an intention. You should, number three, you should, Yechavenin Tzorat Zmol Kiddush Hashem. So when you say Laman Shmo Be'ava, you should have intention. This is just like a, a standard prayer book. You should have intention to sacrifice yourself, at least mentally, on Kiddush Hashem, on the sanctification of God's name. Like, 
<laughs> You're just davening Amida. All of a sudden tells you you should think about sac sacrificing your life in order to sanctify God's name. Um, I, I'm just showing you this because it's like, this is so matter of fact, but for, for like us in Ashkenazi cultures, it's like, uh, in society, it's like, what are you talking about? Here, so every blessing in the Amida has a different spelling of God's name with different vowels. So here are some vowels. Um, and that's a standard thing in, in, in the prayer book. So I'll show you another one. Here's another one. This is for Mechayim team. It's a different vowel usage. This is, again, this idea that you should have intention as you pray um, for different names. Here's another one, right? So, and it's just kind of like this, this spirituality just pop in the prayer book, even for the lay person, that they're supposed to have intention and think about these things as they pray, not just for the mystics. So that's kind of want to show you like the natural world, the natural spirituality, and how it's integrated um, in a very direct way in uh, Sephardic life. All right, so now I'm going on to page, page four. I'm gonna, I'm seeing that we're not gonna have time to get to this, this, uh, through this um, PowerPoint, but we'll get through what we get through today, and we'll, we'll put a little bit more in tomorrow, uh, into the next week, and we'll be fine. All right, so I'm going to page four. Okay, so page four in your source sheet. So I'm gonna stop the share here. Um, if you have your source sheet, I'm just going to read to you um, page five, actually. Uh, page five on the left side, the bottom column. The synagogue services of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur were chanted in an uplifting tone, right? So uh, when you go into, I mentioned this last week, I'm going to show you a video of it, okay? I'm going to show you a video of what a uh, what Spartak Slichot looked like, okay? Selichot, as they call them. That's, um, we call them in our show, Selichot. The synagogue services in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur were chanted in an uplifting tone. Certainly the music reflected the seriousness of these holy days. Um, but they were not tearful or overly somber. Many of the prayers chanted by the congregation actually sounded happy. Okay? One of the solemn hymns sung in Yom Kippur, for example, has the following refrain. Chatanu lefanecha rachem aleinu. This hymn was sung with great enthusiasm. I'm going to show you that in a moment. A video of that to a lively melody. If one did not know what the words went, one would think the Spartan were singing a happy song, not a contrite confession of sinfulness. So the video I'm going to show you right now. Um, so I'm going to uh, next paragraph, page five, second column, second half of the page, the top top paragraph. The Spartan spirit was essentially optimistic and happy. Yes, they recited penitential prayers and confessed their sins, but they maintained a confident belief that God loved them, was compassionate, wanted them to rejoice in God's blessings. This attitude. Evident even on the most solemn days of the Jewish calendar, characterized as Sephardim throughout the year. All right, I got a chat here. Let me just see. Okay. Um, somebody, uh, okay, we're continuing. So um, anyway, if you have any questions, by the way, please feel free to put them in the chat. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll chat section, I'll, I'll, I will attend to them. Um, okay, so let me just share computer sounds here. So take a look here. Here are some verses I thought of for the optimism within the Sephardic culture. Again, I'm not saying Ashkenazi more and optimistic. I'm not, and then there's definitely Hasidim. And I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not into dichotomies. I don't think one's better than the other, to be honest. I like both of these cultures and I grew up in both of them, more in Ashkenazi culture, actually. So, uh, but I will say that there is a little bit of an upbeat, um, like cheerful spirit in synagogue around the high holidays and in general in Sephardic uh, circles. And perhaps it's because, I mean, this is mentioned in different, different texts, that there was less persecution in those areas than what happened in Ashkenazic areas. That's really something that influences how someone feels about themselves and the amount of stress that somebody's under. Uh, a lot of times, uh, Sephardim had good connections with their neighbors, and uh, that reflects itself just in the general culture and the relaxed, um, and, uh, the relaxed um, like, uh, temperament. So again, another source of optimism could be the simple Easter mentality that we mentioned before, meaning when things aren't overly complicated, you're not analyzing or, or overly scrutinizing your behavior, reflecting on it, you could be chilled out. So there's a certain simple Easter mentality. Again, I think it's valuable to, to scrutinize and just being simple, I don't think interests me, but there's definitely a certain simplicity, which is a very natural way of living. You see this in the Yemenite community, probably perhaps even more to some extent. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment at the end of um, the semester. Um, again, there's a, a source, another source of optimism is they were very connected to mysticism. 
So mysticism always has like an upbeat view on things. And so, so um, that probably influenced how they thought. And also this, this communal orientation. So um, everything's very communal in Sephardic, uh, Sephardic circles. Um, and we'll see in a moment how their synagogues are laid out. It's in a communal, in a communal fashion. Actually, I'll show you that right now, actually. Um, take a look at their synagogues. Um, take a look at their synagogues, how, how some of them are laid out. Okay, so the synagogue's laid out. Here's two people hanging out. The synagogue's laid out in a way that people are facing each other. You don't have that in Ashkenazic synagogues uh, for the most part. And all the Sephardic synagogues, uh, most of them are laid out this way. Take a look here, right? This lends itself to this like communal feel where everybody's um, kind of like together in davening. And even the, even the davening is daven together. Um, so there's a prayer leader who leads everybody and you all sing your prayers in unison with the prayer leader. I personally, um, I'll just stop my share. Uh, I personally like this, but also didn't like it. Meaning like, I like my space. I like to like not have somebody lead me. I like just to go at my own pace. So I have mixed feelings about that. But you feel when you walk into like a Sephardic Kiddush that, um, and you're connected with those people there, it can be like very, it was a very strong communal feel. So here we go. I'm gonna show you uh, this video now. Um, here is the Sephardic Slichot. Here they're praying, they're saying, Anenu, answer us, right? Answer us, Hashem. So you could say this in a very sad way, answer us. They're singing, they're passing the microphone around the room, and this happens. Everybody takes a part and they sing it in a very lively way. This is the part that he mentioned in the book. This is the part we say we sinned. Let me see. I'm getting a tag here. Uh, uh, they're not speaking Ladino. They're speaking Hebrew, actually. <laughs> Maybe the music's Ladino. So listen to this song. This is Chatanu Lefanecha. We sinned in front of you. Have mercy, Rachemelin, have mercy on us. But see how they sing it. <laughs> this is how it's sung in every synagogue. <laughs> show you this is a I'm gonna show you one more thing here is just like what it might look what it looks like sometimes in Spartac homes when they sing songs or in synagogue this is a Revivo you should check this out the Revivo project they have a lot of awesome medleys here's the Don Alon medley <laughs> So obviously, this kind of probably triggers a lot of people because they're not socially distant. This is done before Corona, but um, but take a look at like all the food, all the togetherness, all the like the soul and the passion they put in. And also take a look at the 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 wide um, like the spectrum of religious observance in the room. It's all kinds of people together and you'll find a lot in Spartacus. Oh, 
אלוקים נתן לך במתנה את החיים על פני האדמה. נתן לך חגים ושבתות את ישראל. אוקיי, אני חושב שזה עוד פעם, אוקיי. אוקיי. We're back. All right, so right now, um, so you got a little taste of that. That's our spirituality. Um, and I'm going to take a look at our chat section here. Um, okay. Where are the women? Somebody asked. <laughs> so, okay, so that is a really important point. Um, uh, so at that, some Svartic synagogues are actually done. They're, so, All right, we'll talk about that when we get to the, the customs, but a lot of the Sephardic culture has not progressed in that sense, um, where um, if, you, if you consider progression in the sense that like the enlightenment and the different isms did not pass through those countries. And so they're kind of, they're kind of maintained uh, the different roles between men and women as they were in earlier years. So although, of course, Sephardic women are some of the strongest women I met, but in terms of their participation in synagogue, like you're not going to find like a, um, I don't know, like a um, open Sephardic, open Orthodox or some sort of Sephardic, like Sephardic reform or something like that. You're not going to find that. So, um, so like a lot of times the women are not very, um, like very, are not visible in the synagogue, um, or at least they'll be behind a partition. That, that's oftentimes not visible. So that's something that does stand out in those scenarios compared to like Beth um, So there's more to say on that, um, but let's kind of go on um, to uh, this next piece here. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna go into um, Let's go into, let's go into mysticism next week. Let's do aesthetics and kavod. Okay, it's an interesting topic. Okay, aesthetics and kavod. So this is page, um, this is page, um, page eight in your handout. Okay, and it says, um, it's, let me get All right, it says here, I'm looking at bottom of page eight. He says, um, when Rabbi Moshe Almoznino, uh, he was reflecting, uh, sorry, when he, when he published Regim, I'm not, Regimiento de la Vida, Regiment for Life, he was reflecting a deeply held view amongst Farting of the importance of gracefulness and good manners. His concern for proper etiquette was seen as an expression of the religious imperative of respecting others. Sephardic authors, including those who wrote textbooks for children, stressed good manners and proper comportment. Self-respect needed to be accompanied by respect for others. This idea of respect is a big thing in Sephardic culture. Um, respect for the rabbis, respect for elders, respect for the Torah, respect for, um, respect for the synagogue, for the, for the synagogue. It's kavod. It's, it's more accentuated in Sephardic culture, perhaps because of the communities that surrounded them, the Islamic communities that kind of perhaps um, uh, they learned some of their uh, etiquette from them, which was like giving a lot of respect to the elder, et cetera. Um, and kind of like different decorations for mosques and whatnot. So um, kavod is a big thing. And this idea of aesthetics is very big. It's connected again to the natural life that we mentioned, this idea of engaging all these senses, the visual sense, Uh, the, the visual uh, aesthetics and the visual um, aspects are very pr prominent in Sephardic culture. So um, here, uh, I'm reading here, homes are decorated with a keen sense of aesthetics. Even the poorest Sephardim took pride in neatness and cleanliness and beautifully embroidered fabrics and furnishings and utensils as nice as one could afford. Synagogues are built to as high an aesthetic standard as the community can manage and were maintained with devotion to orderliness and pro uh, pro propriety. propriety. Um, all right, I'm just reading on the page, top of page eight. In the matter of form, Sephardic emphasis on aesthetics, on external experience, on symmetry stands out. That's a big thing too. Symmetry is a big thing. You see, they always want to have things in a uh, laid out symmetric way. Sephardic have a word for it, kavod. 
which every Sephardi learns in Hebrew and is, is in, in his own regional language. Um, okay. So I want to show you just a few um, few examples of this. All right. Okay, I'm reading Ann Pepper's comment. My experience that Sephardic shuls are much more beautifully decorated than Ashkenazi. Sephardic seem to have a more advanced aesthetic and the gardens are more beautiful. So I'm gonna show you a few um, few examples of like some nice shuls, some nice, not shuls, but batei knesset or knis in some communities they call them that. Um, so here's just, uh, this is a synagogue actually around the corner from where I lived in Nachlaot. This is the Ades synagogue. It's Halab, it's from Halab, um, and Halabim in Hebrew. And uh, you'll see again, there's like, there's all these decorations oftentimes on the wall. I don't know if you can see here. Yeah, here's like one. I don't know if that's, that's it. there's decorations on the wall. Um, there's, there's everything has like uh, uh, linen, embroidered linen and rugs are very uh, present in a lot of synagogues. You have like a lot of rugs. And another thing that stands out in Sephardic synagogues is that the, and kind of I'm, I'm using this discussion on Sephardic spirituality to also talk about the customs uh, and the, the culture. So another aspect of the culture is the synagogue. So I'm just taking this as an opportunity to explain to you how a synagogue is laid out, a Sephardic synagogue. If you ever go in, you'll notice that the uh, bima um, up is up in the front, but the amud is in the middle of the synagogues. Here's another example. I don't know if you ever paid attention to this, but that's uh, the same shul, actually, same synagogue, actually. So here's another example. How uh, the amud is in the middle of the synagogue. And, and uh, it's kind of like our synagogues like that, but most synagogues are not like that. Um, actually, our synagogue is not like that. It's not in the middle. Our, in Beth Tefillah, it's, it's near the front, but here it's in the middle. Now, how did they get to this idea of having the Amud in the middle? For years, I thought that it was because of the communal, um, the communal element of Sparta culture where they kind of all sit around and look at each other, right? These people on the right, over here, all right, but look at these people in the, uh, in the, uh, and, and, vice, and, and all around. So I thought for a while that that was the reason, but I did some research on this and it turns out that um, that perhaps is a reason, but another reason is that older Sephardic synagogues were outside, perhaps because of the weather, the hot weather in those communities. This is an example of that. If you look in the middle, they had these little areas where people would sit in for shade, like up here, and then uh, the prayer leader would be in the middle so everybody could hear. And this is able to provide them um, uh, the option, to, they were able to have air circulating as they were praying. Here's another example. You had these, these little uh, areas where they would sit all around, um, these boxes here. And in the middle, they have the prayer service, the amud. And so the synagogues now are modeled after the structure of how it was back then, perhaps for weather conditions, perhaps also so wouldn't it look like they're building a synagogue in Muslim lands, perhaps um, due to limitations in Muslim lands or uh, Islamic lands, they had to uh, build their synagogues like this. So it wasn't looking like they were congregating. Uh, perhaps it's also, um, it's, there's also precedent for this in the Bible where Ezra went to the courtyard to read from the Torah to pray. So uh, there's some precedent for this also in the Bible. So the synagogues today are modeled after that. So that's an interesting fact. Now, I want us to talk about uh, this as aesthetics and kavod. So a lot of kavod or respect is given to the, the Torah and the, and the shul. So here is um, a, some Sephardic, here are some Sephardic Torahs. If you pay attention, they're, um, they're not horizontal, they're not laid down, they stand straight up. And the Sephardic mezuzah also stands straight up. Um, and uh, this so perhaps is a way of like, giving honor to the Torah. And also, if you look at the Sephardic cases, we have one in our synagogue, actually, in Beth Tefillah. Um, they're really beautiful, they're expensive, and they're really heavy. Um, I won't almost drop one, but that's for like another time. But it's like really heavy. You have to pick it up and open it up. It's, um, we'll talk about that maybe when we get to customs, about how Torah looks and how we read from it standing while it's standing up. Now here I want to show you, there's the garb, okay? So this is Rabbi Avad Yosef on the right side and his son, Rabbi Yitzchak Yosef, who's the current chief rabbi of Israel. So this is how uh, the chief rabbis of Israel dressed. And I'll just show you here. I put this in the right corner because it's kind of disrespectful, but uh, they even have like Purim, which is like, is a 
Israeli equivalent of Halloween, the Habdiel, of course, but they have like dressed up like the chief rabbi of Israel. So a lot of people think this is disrespectful, but it's out there. If you go on Amazon, I think you can even find it. I'm sure your kids would love to, your grandkids would love to dress like that. Anyway, um, I just want to show you one more thing. So this idea of respecting the elders is also big. You'll see it and respecting elders and standing, even standing up. So I one time spent some time in this yeshiva, Orachim, which is a Baal Tshuva yeshiva, a Sephardic Baal Tshuva. Like I was, when I was first went to Israel, I was trying to figure out where I fit in. So I would go to like Sephardic yeshivas, Ashkenazi yeshivas. I never really fit in the Sephardic yeshivas, I'll just admit that, um, because I think I grew up too much in Ashkenazi culture. Um, as much as I like all the aspects there, it just doesn't jive with like the way I think and the way I, the way I experience life. So I didn't feel very comfortable there, but a lot of things stood out there though. Um, when I went in there, the, the rabbi walked in the room, okay? Now, you know, uh, at Beth Tefillah, um, like the congregants kind of just like make fun of the rabbis or make fun of Rabbi Wilber because he makes fun of us and, and you. And it's kind of like this, this connection where it's like, it's very like a uh, laid back, friendly connection. Like I know like uh, people call Rabbi Wilber Mitchell, you know? So <laughs> in Spartan communities, that wouldn't have happened <laughs> at all. Like when, when this rabbi, Rabbi Elbaz, of uh, Reuven Elbaz in Orachim walked in the room. Like I was shot. And this happens all the time for the Sparta. Everybody, they just all stood up until the rabbi got to his seat. I think we should institute that. No, I'm just joking. I don't think it would fly. But, um, but there's this idea of like standing up as peers in our text. And perhaps this is people in Muslim cultures where Islamic cultures were like lands were like more careful with this. So the Sephardim are also more careful with this. But there's this idea of showing kavod, honor, not just um, like in many ways, but also in terms of standing. So when a rabbi will walk in a room, and we were careful with this, um, some, some yeshivas that I was in, like you'd stand up for the rabbi when they come in the room. Now, if it's like a, the chief rabbi, you stand up completely. You know, full, you know, um, but uh, for, for other rabbis who are not chief rabbis or whatever, you get up for them like this. And so it would get really annoying, though, I'll admit. Like we're in yeshiva, all these, there's so many, you know, everybody's a rabbi in Israel. So like all these rabbis kept walking in and out of the synagogue and in the, in, the, in the yeshiva, and we have to keep getting up. It's like you're learning, you're up and down, up and down. Anyway, but this is the idea of like showing honor, and it's very, um, oh, so somebody asked, where are women in the Kavod pyramid? Um, Sephardic chief rabbis are more decorated than Ashkenazi chief rabbis. I'm just reading some, some comments here. Um, so, we're going to, let me, let's, let, the women question is really important. I want to do some more investigating into that. We'll give it some more time. Um, uh, I appreciate that, that you're pointing that, that out. And I want to address that in like, like in a covetic way. So we'll do that um, at, a, in a, at a separate time. So I just want to show you kind of like what, what we have left. Um, we didn't get through all, all I wanted to get through, but I think we had fun. And that's what's also important. Um, we're going to pick up where we left off next week. So this is what we have left. Okay. So we still have left mysticism. Um, we're going to talk about the Zohar and the Chacham. Okay, what's the per what's the function of the rabbi in Sparta community? And how is it different than the Ashkenazi community? Okay. We're going to talk about balance. So we'll talk about like the proportion and balance which you can find in Sparta community. And then what everybody loves, schoolot and superstitions. It should be superstitions. Uh, the red, the red, um, the red string and the hamsa and other elements. Um, so I'll just uh, conclude by just saying like. There's a lot of beauty, there's a lot of optimism, there's a lot of fun and um, a lot of natural life in Sephardic community. I think the beauty of Israeli society is that you have, a, the Sephardim and Ashkenazi were brought together to learn from each other. And I think we all have what to learn from each other. Uh, the Sephardim definitely can learn from the Ashkenazi and be more reflective and, and um, perhaps um, like more analytical in certain respects. Um, and a lot of other aspects that are important and, and prominent in Ashkenazi culture. And, Sephard and Ashkenazi should learn from Sephardim, how to go back to like that outdoor Judaism, that natural connection to Hashem, simple faith in Hashem. And uh, the aesthetics also really enhance, can enhance one's spirituality. So um, I think that we all have what to learn from each other. And I'm trying to present to you at least what the Sephardic community has to offer us uh, as an Ashkenazi community.